OK, I would like to call this work session of the Anchorage Assembly to order. This is a confirmation hearing for James Weingartner, Director of Real Estate. It is Wednesday, October 20, 2021. It is 2.43 p.m. and we are noticed until 3.40. Madam Clerk, would you call the roll, please? Ms. Allard? Here. Mr. Constant? Here. Mr. Dunbar? Here. Ms. Kennedy? Here. Ms. LaFrance? Here. Mr. Presbordia? Mr. Peterson? Present. Ms. Quinn Davidson? Mr. Rivera? Present. Mr. Weddleton? And Ms. Salatal? Thank you, Madam Clerk. I want to make a note that documents for this work session are available at muni.org. If you click on the assembly page on the assembly work sessions um, box and scroll down, you'll be able to get to the documents. Um, a note on the format of this hearing, we'll begin with a brief five minute or so introduction from the administration uh, by Mr. Chewbacca the Chief Human Resources Officer for the Municipality, followed by a brief introduction of himself by Mr. Weingarner, and then we will have time for member questions. Before we begin, I do want to call attention to Charter Section 5.02, Powers of the Mayor, which states, quote, the mayor shall appoint all heads of municipal departments subject to confirmation by the assembly on the basis of professional qualifications, end quote. Members are urged to keep in mind that we want to be careful concerning the reputations of nominees. Questions should be limited to education and work experience. Please be aware of any sensitive personnel issues that may not be legally permissible for discussion in a public forum. If members have relevant questions concerning personal characteristics or habits, we can consult with legal counsel to consider holding a special meeting and executive session on a later date or offering the nominee the option to waive the executive session. I also want to read something from the municipal attorney's office. The municipal attorney's office requests that during its work session regarding Mr. Weingartner's appointment, the assembly refrain from raising or discussion, discussing any topic regarding the subject matter at issue in the recently filed litigation Hendrickson versus MO. The complaint alleges retaliation for bringing a whistleblower complaint and a violation of the covenant of good faith and fair dealing. To illustrate, please avoid questions concerning discussions between Mr. Weingartner and Ms. Hendrickson, the events that led up to her termination, Mr. Weingartner's opinion on Mr. Hendrickson's allegations, Ms. Hendrickson's attempts to place her own candidate in certain positions, and Mr. Weingartner's opinion of Ms. Hendrickson's qualifications and employment. And we do have municipal counsel available if there are specific questions concerning that. So now I would like to turn to Mr. Chewbacca for an introduction of the appointee. Mr. Chewbacca. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, it's really a pleasure to introduce you to, to, to Jim Weingartner. Uh, he's a longtime member of the Anchorage community whom Mayor Bronson has nominated to serve as Director of Real Estate for the municipality. Jim moved to Anchorage in the spring of 1990 when Arco transferred him to Alaska for what was supposed to be a two-year assignment as a landman. 30 years later, he's still here and he's a proud Alaskan. Uh, Jim's three children were educated through the Anchorage School District system. All of them obtained college degrees and one is now a medical doctor in the Army. As a father, Jim was actively involved in his children's athletic endeavors, even coaching boys and girls club soccer teams and serving as president of Alaska Swimming for many years. After receiving his degree in real estate from Southern Methodist University, Jim began his now 40 year career as a landman. Throughout his impressive career, he's worked on the acquisition and divestment of land in support of many high value development projects. And he's a, he has a demonstrated ability to negotiate 
win-win commercial agreements that have withstood the test of time. One example I'd like to highlight is the surface access agreement he negotiated with the Cookpick Corporation, the Native Village Corporation for Nuiqsid, Alaska. Without that surface access agreement, ConocoPhillips would not have been able to develop the Alpine oil and gas field, a $1.3 billion development located on the North Slope of Alaska. That surface, that, that surface access agreement, among other contracts that Jim has negotiated throughout his career, illustrates his expertise in establishing productive professional relationships and his effectiveness in working with Alaska's many cultures and indigenous peoples. Jim already has proven himself a great asset to our municipality. Mayor Bronson respectfully requests you confirm him as director of real estate and he thanks you for your consideration. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chewbacca. Before we go to Mr. Weingartner, I wanna note for the record that Ms. Zalatel joined at 2.46 p.m. and Mr. Weddleton at 2.48 p.m. Mr. Weingartner. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, let me get my screen. And could you turn up your volume a bit? It's sort of hard to hear you. Video appears to be frozen. Okay. Can hear you a little bit. Is that better? It's a little bit better. Hello. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm correct. When, I'm, when timing works out perfectly, I'm correct. Sorry, it's uh, my video is not working right now. And you may want to turn off your video and just use the audio portion for a faster connection. Mr. Weingartner, are you yeah. still with us? Great. Okay, just go ahead. Um, thank, you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair and Assembly members. I'm honored and humbled to appear before you today as the mayor's nominee for director of real estate. I want to thank Mayor Bronson for entrusting me with this responsibility and for supporting me through this confirmation process. I'd also like to thank the mayor's executive team and the real estate department staff for being for their support and guidance over the last few months. Throughout <clears throat> throughout my years of schooling, I was a competitive swimmer. My swimming career taught me that success can be achieved with hard work and attention to details. I was fortunate to experience great success in swimming, including a college scholarship participation in the 1980 Olympic trials and becoming an American record holder in the medley relay at the Olympic trials. Swimming gave me my work ethic. I applied that same work ethic to my degree program at Southern Methodist University. While at SMU, I worked with Cox School of Business Dean of Real Estate to develop a curriculum that led to a new land management degree program. I later received a Bachelor of Business Administration majoring in real estate and was nominated by all the professors in real estate department to receive the Greater Dallas Board of Realtors Award in real estate. I was honored with that award in 1981. As mentioned in Nikki's introduction, I have three children. All are grown now. I have five grandchildren. Unfortunately, all my grandchildren live in Colorado Springs. 
<clears throat> if not for military orders, I'm certain they would all be here in Anchorage. My son Hunter is an Army emergency medical doctor. He will soon be a lieutenant colonel. He and his wife have two children. My daughter Brett is married to an Air Force pilot who is also soon to be a lieutenant colonel. They have three children. My youngest daughter, Sierra, is an event planner for sustainability conferences. She and her husband live in Eagle River. They don't have any children yet. I'm truly blessed to have healthy children who are productive and caring citizens. I know that growing up in Anchorage and going through the Anchorage school system contributed to their success. For over 40 years, I've been a landman. I've enjoyed every aspect of the process of putting together a land transaction, from brainstorming with coworkers, generating the initial ideas, to digging into the research and determining ownership and the permit constraints that make the, that must be addressed, to formulating a strategy that will maximize the value of the transaction for all parties involved, to presenting that strategy to management for approval, to initiating negotiations with counterparts, to drafting the agreement, and finally to closing the transaction and achieving a win-win result for all parties. During, during the introduction, Nikki described the surface access agreement I negotiated with Cookpick Corporation, the village corporation of New Ixit. That was a significant agreement, and at the time, the first agreement successfully negotiated by the industry with Cookpick. After 20 years, the agreement still governs the relationship between Cookpick and ConocoPhillips. It provides for development activities surrounding the village of New Ixit while preserving the village's subsistence hunting culture. The agreement also has added and continues to add significant value to the parties involved. It shows how important land management agreements are to a community. Another agreement I was recently involved with while acting as director of real estate illustrates one of the many ways the value can be added to the municipality of Anchorage. It was the renewal of a lease agreement for a portion of the Muldoon Mall for use by the Boys and Girls Club. The terms of the lease renewal had been negotiated by my predecessor and were presented to me for approval just one day before the old lease expired. Rather than just signing off on the lease renewal, I took the time to meet with the owner of the Muldoon Mall and representatives of the Boys and Girls Club. They gave me a tour of the Boys and Girls Club facility. During that tour, we identified and negotiated three improvements that were needed. The owner agreed to provide those improvements during the term of the lease. A new bathroom redesign, remodel, new light fixtures in the gymnasium, and new flooring in all the offices. All these improvements amount to an estimated cost of over 100,000, which was more than 5% of the value of the five-year lease. This added value may not seem like a significant amount, but if we add 5% value or save 5% on just one deal per month, it would add up to a significant number over the course of a year. It would increase the return on the municipality's investment in the real estate department. My philosophy has been that land is the basis of all wealth. Even given that philosophy, I believe it's very important to analyze the commercial terms of any transaction. If the transaction does not make good commercial sense, then it's OK to renegotiate those terms or walk away from the table. Also, the contractual terms must be clearly and completely described in the agreement. The agreement is our roadmap that will lead to a successful closing of a transaction. If the terms are unclear, then the transaction can be delayed or even result in litigation. As director of real estate for the municipality of Anchorage, I will make every effort to ensure all the commercial agreements we execute are clear, complete, and profitable to the municipality. To that end, I will collaborate with representatives from the municipality's other departments, specifically financial groups for analysis of commercial terms, and with legal department for contract drafting and review. In closing, I'd like to thank all the assembly members for considering my nomination, especially those who took the time to meet with me. If I'm confirmed, I look forward to working with you all. 
I'm happy to answer any questions you may have at this time. Thanks. OK, I'll go ahead and go through the queue, starting with Ms. Zelatel. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Mr. Weingartner, for joining us today. Um, I've had an opportunity to speak with you previously. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit about what you ended with there in your statement about getting um, great or good um, financial terms and the best deal for the municipality. How do you balance that viewpoint with um, the public interest of government and things the that the government needs to do sometimes that may not always be the most profitable um, moving forward, but that there are uh, non-monetary, that there's mon non-monetary value um, perhaps in those transactions. How would you evaluate those situations um, and present those opportunities to the administration and the assembly? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, thank you for that question. Assembly member Zalatel. I, um, when, when I think about the, the concept of commercial um, value, that includes some of the value that would be applicable to um, the community and, uh, and kind of a needs-based situation. If, if, a, if a nonprofit needed some land, for instance, for a development, then, then you know, the, the, the analysis of the commercial terms would, would include the fact that, you know, we're, we're benefiting the community. And so it's not to say that it's always got to be dollars and cents when I say commercial analysis. So, we, you know, we can look at, at the uh, intrinsic value of other things. Madam Chair, can I uh, just do a quick follow up to that? Sure, go ahead, Ms. Alatel. Thank you. Um, thank you for giving the example of land to a nonprofit. Could you talk to me about that situation in the inverse? So something the municipality may want to acquire where um, maybe we would have to pay more than you would like, but then there could be additional value. How would you present that to us where um, maybe there's public concern about the cost of a particular transaction, but you can see the utility and how it perhaps fits within our various plans. Uh, thanks for the question through the chair. Assembly member Zalatel, I, I think um, it's important in that scenario that, you know, that you look at alternatives and and then also you'd be comparing those alternatives to the the property that you're wanting and if you could then enter into negotiations with the the owners of those of that specific property that you obtain and and try to use some leverage to reduce that cost um and and again i i wouldn't be hesitant to to enter into the negotiation and and try to to uh, get the best possible deal for the for the city. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Zalatel. Thank you, Mr. Weingartner. Um, before we move on to Mr. Weddleton, I want to note that Mr. Perez Verdia joined us at 3:01 p.m. Mr. Weddleton. Mr. Weddleton? Are you still there? We can't hear you. Okay, we'll we'll come back to Mr. Weddleton. Mr. Dunbar? Thank you, Madam Chair. And I, I have a, a few questions, so I think I'll just I'll just ask one or two and I'll get back in the queue after my colleagues. Um, get to ask theirs as well. Um, so, uh, Mr. Weingartner, looking at the, the resume you, you submitted, um, you know, the, wor the work experience here, <clears throat> excuse me, ends uh, 
April 2020. Um, but I, my understanding is that you did work in the municipality as well before this position. And so could you describe just a little bit what you did, um, you know, what your title was and what your uh, sort of what role you performed um, in the last several months before coming into this position at the municipality? And then I have another question after that. Through the chair, uh, thank you, Assembly Member Dunbar, for the question. Um, so I apologize that the, I do have an updated resume that unfortunately didn't get up on the um, system quick enough. But uh, yes, so I, I did start with the municipality when the new administration came in in July, and uh, I was initially um, working as uh, on housing issues, and and so I um, I actually made some good headway on on um, ideas that could increase housing in in uh, Anchorage. One of those is a uh, tax exemption for accessory dwelling units, also known as ADUs, and uh, that's one thing that that I realized we could do without the need for any additional land. Um, so in my early days with the municipality, I didn't have any control of any land situation. So looking at increasing density through encouraging accessory dwelling units to be built seemed like a, a good way to increase housing within Anchorage. <clears throat> so the there, there's two things that uh, that benefit from ADUs, more ADUs. You end up with more housing, but you also have a stimulation of the economy because you have folks that aren't big developers that are, have to go in and do a whole subdivision. You have, um, you know, the people of Anchorage have that right to go build their own ADU in their backyard if they, if assuming all the, they meet all the permit requirements. Um, so it brings it down and motivates in um, the construction of, of housing on a, on a different level than a, a uh, developer level. Thank you. Um, so I was wondering if you could uh, next talk a little bit about the mission of the Heritage Land Bank as, as you see it um, and sort of what role it might have uh, in the in, you know, sort of broader public policy. And the last question I have uh, for now is about the Brownfield program. And if we are continuing with that um, and sort of what you see the future is of that program. Thank you, Madam Chair. Through the chair, th thank you, Assembly Member Dunbar for that question, um, or those questions. So with regard to the Heritage Land Bank, um, I see a, a real fiduciary responsibility with regard to that land. Um, it's it's designed for present as well as future citizens of uh, Anchorage. So um, we have to be real stewards of that that land because as we develop it, it goes away and and we are diminishing our our inventory. So um, I think we, in that regard, I'm, I don't think we have to limit ourselves to just divestiture of, of land out of the Heritage Land Bank. We can start looking at acquisitions. So, um, and and then again, I, I don't, a lot of times folks think that preserving the value and, and uh, managing it for the, for the uh, good of, present and future citizens means you have to, you know, make a, um, a less than fair market value deal on, on the land. I, I believe that we can market this land and at market rates and, um, and that's going to help benefit the, not only the present, but the future citizens of Anchorage. So um, we're looking at potential developments out of the Heritage Land Bank inventory this year. 
and uh, and we're starting to work on our one year plan for 2022 and then associated with that as a five year plan coming up and so um, some exciting ideas that we have and and uh, especially you know girdwood is um is where a, a large holding of, of heritage bank land is so um that's a critical location for our activity going forward uh, regarding the brownfield program uh, we are we do want to continue that um there however uh there's there's situations where where that that uh grant those those funds have to be managed in in a certain way so that you know the the qualifications for the use of those funds it has to be just right and so um we're working on we do have some cleanups to do unfortunately that don't qualify for that brownfield program but um you know we definitely want to continue that Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Weingartner. So we'll go back to Mr. Weddleton. Mr. Weddleton. Oh, thanks. Yeah, sorry. Bob bobbled my mute. Can you hear me now? We can hear. You. Oh, good. So, Jim, I appreciate your meeting um, with uh, Susanna me a couple of days ago. And I want to just hit some points that we had then. And I know you would be real estate and HLB, a typical combination. And, you know, HLB's got so much to the land and it in the kind of management directive is, you know, benefit present and future citizens of Anchorage and promote orderly development and achieve the goals of the comprehensive plan. And if you haven't set aside, you know, a long weekend to go through the stack of documents that make up the comprehensive plan, it would serve you well. It's very, you know, there's quite a lot in there and an awful lot of it really draws away from, you know, what would you know, in a business sense, be profitable use of land. And I, I know we've discussed a bunch of that here. And, and in particular, there's there's certain things that can be profitable, but they're they're challenging too. And I, I, an example is, um, you know, Section 36 off of um, kind of Canyon Road there. There was uh, a lot of work we're doing, uh, wetlands, mitigation lands so for selling that. But we'll also, um, there's examples where Aries Land Bank can provide simply Greenbelt corridors, and you know, above Potter Marsh is something that's in the five-year plan to do that. Um, and then just uh, again in that area and others, you know, it's just use the land and commit it to being used just to protect groundwater and so on. So it's really hard to put a dollar value on that. But they're in the plans, and it's it's more studies and knowledge of the area that that these things have long-term benefit. I mean, that, so how, how would you? factor that in when you're looking at land and pondering what to do with it. Uh, through the chair, thank you, Assembly Member Weddleton for the question. Um, I I think in, in those scenarios, and you brought up some a, a wide range of them, and, and of course there's also the uh, wetland conservation easements that we find that we, we're managing as well. And in fact, a lot of times we can um, we can <clears throat> help a developer by granting some some conservation easements, and that that would be through a uh, a similar type of wetland bank, for instance. Uh, we don't have a wetland bank right now, but uh, that's something that we could look at. And and when you have this wetland bank, you can actually monetize those those wetland credits for instance and then it does two things it, it monetizes the credits but also encourages development so so it, it would help a developer to have um, a wetland mitigation for instance if they're trying to develop a, a tract of land that they own that has wetlands on it then we'd we'd uh, grant them the credit on our land through a conservation easement, so uh, so that that's a, a way that we can monetize some some land that that we don't want to develop. So um, I would look into a little more on some of these projects that you mentioned, um, 
in detail. I, I am familiar a little bit with this section 36, and it is in a, um, and I, I don't know the total number of, of acres of wetland in there, but um, that does have some development potential in, in, in around there because of the neighborhoods. So um, it'd be interesting to see, look into that in more detail. Thank you, Mr. Weingartner. Any follow up, Mr. Whittleton? Well, not not on that. I have another question that's real different. So I don't know if you wanted it. You could work your way. I see other people in the queue. You could get back to me if you want. Or you can ask it now. That's fine. OK, so Jim, I'm kind of looking through <coughs> excuse me, the code stuff. So um, one of the things in our code says executive director of the Heritage Land Bank shall be appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the assembly. We know that. And then it adds acting upon the recommendation of suitable candidates made by the Heritage Land Bank Advisory Commission. And, and that's a very unique um, process for directors. Is, has that been done or is that in process going to the HLB? It almost looks like that's where it would start. They come up with a list. But um, just, anyway, can you address the status on that? Yes, uh, thank, uh, through the chair, thank you. Assembly Member Weddleton. Um, so I, I think it needs to be clarified that my nomination right now is is only for director of real estate. And so that process of going through the Heritage Land Bank Advisory Commission to get a recommendation has not occurred yet. And uh, and I think the, the mayor is reserving the right to um, provide other potential candidates for that position. Um, so my my hearing today only is in reference to director of real estate. OK, that's helpful. So um, OK, so then to fill the HLB role, is there a plan, a plan for that or are you involved with that? Uh, I am involved. Um, Unfortunately, we were scheduled to have a advisory commission meeting tomorrow, um, but we were down to only four advisory commissioners and one was not available, so we didn't have a quorum. But uh, once we get a, a full slate, which is seven advisory commissioners, then um, we'll be able to conduct business a little more efficiently. But right now we'll have to wait until November um, there may be a way we can get a special meeting called um, which for issues that don't require notice. Um, but of course, we got to deal with the notice provisions with any kind of um, hearings that we have. All right. Um, no, thank you. You thank bet. You, thank, you. thank you, Mr. Weingartner. So I have Mr. Constant, then Ms. Allard, and then we'll go back through with Ms. Zalatel and then Mr. Dunbar. Mr. Constant. Thank you. I'm sorry we didn't have a chance to meet. I was out of town for approximately two weeks. Um, so I would like to hear you describe your understanding of Title 25 and how it works, what it's about, and also your understanding of NALA, North Anchorage Land Agreement. Uh, through the chair, thank you, Assembly Member Constance, for the question. I um, so the um, Title 25 basically sets out the rules of of, um, of my job as director of real estate, and of course, it's got a specific section for the Heritage Land Bank as well. But it it lays out the um, all the notice requirements and and uh, authorities and and what uh, what we're allowed to uh, to enter into from a negotiation standpoint or or a um, and when we're in a divestment situation what, whether we need to um, go out to the public for competitive bidding or um, if we can do a an RFP for instance so so really, you know, that this is a critical rule book for us to follow 
when we look to do anything within the real estate or or Harry's Land Bank. And then um, remind me again of the second question. I'm sorry. Mr. Constance? Assembly yeah, Constance. I'm sorry, it was muted. The North Anchorage Land Agreement, NALA. Oh, NALA, that's right. So, uh, yeah, NALA is a um, an agreement between min the municipality, um, the military, and then also uh, Chugat. Um, and so, the um, it, it's basically a, a sharing of how the land was going to be divvied divvied up up there, and then if the the um, the military base is reduced in size, then you know how that land would come out and and be shared between the parties. So um, so it's um, it's in place still and and um, still functioning, and of course. Uh, I, I would like to start entering into some discussions with the uh, J Bear. Um, there are some things that around the edges that need to be dealt with, and and I think um, you know entering into some discussions to brainstorm ideas about how we deal with, um, for instance, around Beach Lake. There's some impacts from noise, and um, and I think the uh, the J Bear is, is interested in acquiring a, a development easement on some lands up there and and it's a park land but that would that would add some value if we were able to monetize some of that. So um so there's some interesting potential potential transactions that would could happen up in the Nala area. Yeah, so just a note, it's not Chugash or Chugak, it's with the native village of Aklutna. And um, I guess the takeaway for me, Nala, is that the relationships with our other landholding parties in the municipality are very important because if we don't figure out how to work together, we end up in court. And that's very expensive and we often lose. And so um, the, the hope that I have is you will be well aware of that agreement and its terms and how we got to where we are with it because it was an overreach by the municipality that drove us to legal uh, to, to the bench and have to deal with a lot that came from this. So I, I think that this and other agreements that we have are really important to have you spooled up on. Thank you. Yes, I'll, I'll um, I, I'm interested to hear where you think it is uh, an overreach and and but I'll I'll, um, I'll look through the agreement and uh, oh no it's not an overreach what what was an overreach was at the time there was an effort to take the gas and monetize it when we didn't have a right to take the gas because the previous relationship and agreements with the tribe and it's a pretty in-depth process by which we came to where we are today okay Thank you, Mr. Constant. Thank you, Mr. Weingartner. We'll go ahead and move on to Ms. Allard. Thank you. Hi, Jim. It's good to have you on today. And uh, you forgot to say on your resume that you're also a triathlete. So uh, I appreciate everything you do. My question to you is focused more on Eagle River and uh, how you believe uh, you can bring some good to Eagle River. And in perhaps builders developing out here with incentives, like you said, with the tax deduction for the ADU. Um, and I'd also like to say you have my support um, to go forward with the negotiations with J-Bear, most definitely um, to try to figure out a middle ground of where we could support our J-Bear installation and then also um, where we could benefit from it as well. But could you talk a little bit more on like a short term goal of how you think you could bring a little bit more to Eagle River and maybe shoot out one long term goal as well? Uh, through the chair, thank you, uh, Assembly Member Allard, for the support and question. Um, so uh, up in Eagle River, there's there are some 
some um, activities. We're, we're going through a rezone on on um, one track in particular that that's uh, then slated for development, and um, so that's that's some good activity there. Um, I think uh, the I guess getting back to the ADUs, if we can um, encourage additional um, construction of ADUs out in Eagle River, I think that's not only going to, um, like I said, increase housing, but um, you know, conceivably it could um, increase tourism as well, because um, a lot of times these ADUs end up being rented out to uh, visitors to the to Anchor. And uh, that that's going to be something that you know. I, I think when you when you go to Eagle River, it's amazing how beautiful it is with the mountains. So um, you know we could see additional tourism coming toward Eagle, River. and um, that's something uh, that's not going to happen not only in in Eagle River but all throughout Anchorage. We might see additional Airbnb, for instance, would be. Uh, more prevalent throughout the city with more ADUs. Thank you, Mr. Weingartner. Any follow up, Ms. Allard? Um, just Jim, do you have any type of uh, more of like a a long term goal of you know long term can be in eye of the beholder, but of what you'd like to see happen in Eagle River as far as development? I know we talked about ADU, but any other type of development you're looking at or that would benefit our city? Yeah. Well, um, through the chair, again, thank you for the, the follow up. Um, you know, I think as we, um, as we, you look at, um, Eagle River, it has everything you need there, um, but maybe um, additional medical facilities could uh, be constructed up in Eagle River. Um, we have, of course, our central UMED district in, in uh, the greater Anchorage Bowl area, but then, um, and, and I think this could actually work in Girdwood as well, when you think about um, some of these destination um, medical facilities, uh, for instance, down in Colorado and in, in Aspen, they've got world class orthopedic uh, surgery in, in right in Aspen. And some of that generates from the fact that people come off the, the ski hill with uh, broken bones. But, um, you know, you can create kind of a boutique uh, medical facility there in Eagle River. Uh, thank you, Jim. And yes, the Stedman Clinic is pretty awesome. My girls skied in Vail, so you are correct. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Weingartner. Thank you, Ms. Allard. I've got a few folks uh, lined up in the queue here. We'll go to Ms. Zelatel, then Mr. Dunbar, then Mr. Weddleton, and then Mr. Constant. Ms. Zelatel? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Mr. Weingartner, um, you know, one of the most pressing issues um for us as a city um is homelessness and homelessness you know the solution to homelessness is housing um what experience have you had with housing development and how do you see the real estate department supporting the creation of more affordable housing um so that we can um have a, a pathway towards solving homelessness thank you Through the chair, uh, thank you, Assemblymember Zolotel, for that question. Um, yeah, yeah, it is a diff difficult question, and you know, I, I had the opportunity to meet with a lot of the um, various service providers, like uh, Neighbor Works and um, Cook Inlet Housing Authority, and and um, Alaska Housing Finance Corp. Um, <clears throat> And some of the ideas that we were brainstorming in United Way as well um, were uh, 
and it's along the same lines of a, of a tax incentive. Um, so the idea is that uh, if if a if a owner of a building, for instance, wants to uh, lease one of his uh, units to a uh, to a homeless person, and and I I, would, I guess I would categorize it as as someone that's on this um, this identification system that that identifies uh, homeless um, customers. We'll we'll call them. Um, they they um, would then earn a tax incentive. Um, so, for instance, if you if you had a, a fourplex and and half of your units were leased to a, um, a recipient of of assistance through the uh, either the Section Eight or or some other um, supplement income supplement, then um, that would earn a tax incentive for half of your property tax. And of course that would be, it would only be, you couldn't uh, exempt uh, school tax or uh, special service area taxes from that. But but um, that would maybe encourage landlords to offer up their their housing and uh, and that could add to the inventory of housing for the homeless. Thank you. Um, if I may do a really quick follow up, I realize we're getting short on time, Madam Chair. Go ahead, Ms. Altel. Thanks. So I appreciate your idea there. Um, I'm more curious, like, how do we incentivize housing development? You know, we, we just have a shortage of housing units. How do we get the development moving so that we create affordable housing units? More of them. Thanks. Uh, through the chair, thanks, Assembly Member Salatel, for that question. I, I, I think the um, well, it's it's all a matter of economics. We've got a, um, you know, if you want low cost housing, then we have to make the the whole process has to be um, lower cost, not, not only land but materials and and um, even permitting uh, the process of, of obtaining the pro appropriate zoning um, and and we even talked about you know the wetland um, issue in a lot of the land in um, in Anchorage we're starting to to run out of land that's um, buildable land and so um, and and then you know you're into wetlands and, and so you're filling those those add cost um, so uh, the idea of, of reducing or increasing low cost housing is a t is a very difficult one and and um, i i really don't have an answer for it thank you thank you mr weingartner Thank you, Ms. Alto. We'll go next to Mr. Dunbar, then Mr. Weddleton, then Mr. Constant. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so I have two questions. The first is um, you mentioned uh, the HLB director being broken out as a separate um, position, and I assume it would still be under you. I mean, if you're the head of the real estate department, then there is sort of the HLB is still uh, under that, correct? And then I guess my, 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 my question there also is um, just looking at the real estate department summary in the operating budget we received, and it doesn't look like there's a change in position counts from 2020 to 21 or 22. Um, and perhaps, uh, you know, I know there was kind of a unique arrangement there before, but can you explain that or are you, is, is the separate HLB director as a funded position included in this 2022 proposed budget or will you expect some kind of supplemental um, budget request? Uh, through the chair, thank you, Assembly Member Dunbar for that question. Um, yeah, so the uh, the budget would have to be supplemented if we brought in a, a uh, as another individual to serve as Heritage Land Bank Executive Director. Now that doesn't mean that 
that I'm not going to be recommended as well in the future. So um, that would avoid if, if that were to occur, then that would avoid the need for any kind of budget amendment. Great. Uh Good. I'm glad I wasn't misreading this or misunderstanding this then. Um, and then my second question is about um, just one of the properties that uh, a lot of us have an interest in, and that's the former um, National Archives site, um, you know, large pro uh, property that's in our possession. I understand it was briefly looked at during the um, uh, facilitated process for homelessness, but it was a, a wetland or for some reason it wasn't appropriate. Um, can you describe any sort of plans you might have for that site going forward or any ideas you might have? Thank you. Uh, through the chair, thank you, Assembly Member Dunbar, for that one question. Um, yes, in fact, that that's a, a project that we're looking at this week, in fact. Um, so I appreciate you asking about that. Um, and, and the reason I, it's it's critical is because it is impacting our budget quite a bit because there's a intergovernmental loan that was taken to uh, to fund the acquisition of that. So we don't want to just continue to pay interest without moving a, some sort of development on that. Um, so we're looking at alternatives uh, one alternative which i like is is to um, talk to uh, anchorage community development authority and see if they would be interested in, in acquiring that parcel from from the municipality and then they would bring in developers and um, and monetize it so i think that may be a a project that um, is a good fit for them and then they have the ability to run with it and um, monetize it and I, I think we we need to rezone it so that we can have a multi-use uh, some so commercial and residential maybe some senior housing in there and uh, maybe even some parking so um, those are some ideas that we're kicking around right now. Can I ask a quick follow up to that, Madam Chair? Uh, sure, go ahead. Just very quick. Um, can you explain, Jim, and, and, and that, that all, you know, senior housing, that kind of thing sounds great. Can you explain why ACDA, why we have to transfer to ACDA to do that rather than municipality or, or, you know, the real estate department doing it itself directly since we, you know, own and control the land? Uh, well, you know, it it has been with the the real estate department for a couple of years. Um, uh, now I wasn't involved, but unfortunately, nothing happened um, with it while we had it. Um, I would, you know, if it doesn't go to ACDA, then you know, I, uh, the plans to, to rezone and and monetize is is something we want to do. Figuring out who's best suited to uh, to take that forward um, you make a good point why why ACDA um, I think if you if you look at ACDA they, they have the ability to bring in uh, additional manpower for project management and uh, you know the the cost structures um, and, and then also monetizing it they have the opportunity to uh, to grow that that organization. Great. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Dunbar. Thank you, Mr. Ryan Gardner. I just want to note too that since this is a work session, we can run a little bit over if folks can stay around and if we need to. So we'll go next to Mr. Weddleton and then Mr. Constant. Thanks. I'll try to talk really fast. Um, so Jim, you've mentioned ADUs a number of times, which is probably not strictly a real estate action, but we did change the rules uh, a couple of years ago that essentially allows ADUs in any zoning now. We don't really even strictly have any single family zoning now. Um, so more of those uh, hopefully will be built. Um, you know, you, you Meg had kind of broached, you know, how do you create more affordable housing and leverage, you know, land that the city owns? And there is an example that's probably not technically what Meg thinks of as affordable, 
housing, but in terms of Girdwood, it is. And that's, um, you know, we've got a proposal for Holton Hills phase one, I think we've, we've seen and be coming at us in a little bit. And that is an interesting combination where by using some of the land where they can make um, more money, they can take other land and make some smaller units, smaller pieces of property to allow, you know, relatively cheaper homes in Girdwood. So it's just kind of very creative process that led to that. And that's phase one. And once they see how that goes, phase two and so on. And, and that was an interesting participation for the city to bring some utilities there. And then the return is split in the profits. Which, so I, I just wanted that's so that's kind of been laid in front of you. Now you were there to make it so. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, through the chair, thank you, Assembly Member Weddleton. Uh, well, that's that is a very active, ongoing project, and, and in fact, we're working with the uh, Girdwood Board of Supervisors for a a rezone, as well as the Land Use Committee down there uh, in Girdwood, and so um, next month at those, their meetings, we're going to be presenting in detail the rezone to support that Holton Hills Phase One. Um, that uh, I guess. Uh, maybe I, I should have adjusted my my thinking of, of what uh, affordable housing is. I, I think you know it's different levels, and I and I very much support the Holton Hills project, and I think that is going to offer some, like you said, um, less expensive housing, and and so um, that is a good example of of uh, you know designing. The, the lot size so that um, the cost of of running water and sewer to each of those lots is reduced. Um, then also um, using uh, different uh, like townhouse um, construction as and mixed in with single family and then multifamily housing all in the same neighborhood. And then of course you do you could have some um, larger lots as well, so so it's not it's not just a um, a one size fits all in that phase one. It's it's got a nice blend of of different sizes and shapes of of, of lots and and cost of lots. So um, hopefully that'll lead to lower cost housing. Thanks. Yeah, it's an interesting proposal, and it's something I guess true across the board. But there's a lot of people who live in or work in Girdwood who have to drive or bus down to Girdwood routinely. So anything we build in or that is built in Girdwood can also free up homes in the bowl. Uh, that's a good point. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Weddleton. Thank you, Mr. Weingartner. Mr. Constant. Thank you, uh, sir. You mentioned uh, two different vehicles for tax abatement. One is a proposal of, for uh, ADUs, and one is a proposal for homeless uh, provision of homeless uh, housing, housing to help people get out of homelessness. And I support both of these concepts. Have you had an opportunity to run these through legal to to get an understanding of how these can be authorized? Because the specific exemptions for us have to be granted under state law. Um, I have progressed the oh um, through the chair. Thank you, Assembly Member Constance. Um, I have progressed the ADU um, a, uh, ordinance and memo through legal and also through um, the assessors group. We have a we formed a um, uh, tax exemption working group and. Um, so we're tackling the ADU first, um, and and along with that, and in parallel to it, is a, um, a change to the a Title 21 that um, requires uh, owner occupancy of of uh, the main house of the ADU. Um, so I think that's that's something that needs to be changed in in concert with the same ADU tax exemption um process <clears throat> but then once we get that kind of 
finalized and we have a, a good draft right now and that could move pretty quickly. The um, the one with the homeless is is more complicated and um, it's going to take some some thinking because um, working with the assessor, how do we we track for example, for example, I mentioned the fourplex where half of it is is um, offered to uh, recipients of, of Section 8 housing um, credits, for instance, and that that you know, how how do you track that? Well, um, and what if that um, tenant doesn't stay a whole year, a whole tax year, for instance? So we're trying to work through and brainstorm that concept and, and figure out how we do that without burdening the assessor's office. So just a quick note then to follow that up, you know, I, I am supportive of creative vehicles to address housing policy and, and ADUs, et cetera. Um, but the ADU code change, it might seem like an easy thing, but just you wait till the public shows up. So uh, know that it's unlikely to be as easy as it might seem. It would it would be a different ordinance, so can see but presented at the same time one could go forward without the other conceiving. Yeah, the, the ADU conversation brings out a whole lot of people. Okay, well, go ahead. Oh no, go ahead, Mr. Weingartner. I, I was just going to say, you know, I, hopefully that they'll see the value and, and um, you know, the potential for everyone to, to, that can, can create value of their own. Thank you, Mr. Weingartner, and thank you, Mr. Constant. It's uh, 3.45 p.m., and I don't see any other assembly members in the queue, so we'll go ahead and wrap up. Before we do, I want to note that Mr. Weingartner's confirmation is on the October 27 Wednesday agenda, and it is item 10D4, 10 Delta 4. And um, Mr. Weingartner, I know we're at the end of our time, but if you wanted to make a quick final comment before we adjourn, you are welcome to do so. Thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I just want to say thank you to all the assembly members for their time today and, and uh, considering me my nomination. Um, I look forward to uh, working with all of you. Thanks. Did we lose you, Ms. LaFrance? So I, it appears that we've lost her and I see no other questions. I'm going to go ahead and adjourn this work session. All right, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.